When you need to figure out the right answer to a difficult question, one of the best tools to use, and yet not as well known as it should be, is the Delphi method. So in this video, I'm going to answer the question, what is the Delphi method? And how do we apply it? The Delphi method takes its name from the oracle at Delphi, the ancient Greek temple where people were able to discern the future. Or so the ancient Greeks believed. We have no way to judge. But really? Anyway, as a modern way of solving difficult problems, the Delphi method goes back to 1969 when it was developed in the US by the Rand Corporation. They used it as a way to facilitate technological forecasting. Yes, trying to see the future and identify what would happen. Is it possible? Well, it turns out that to a degree it is, if the circumstances are right and if you facilitate the process properly. The major benefit of the Delphi method is it overcomes one of the problems of getting people in a room to talk about a problem or to try to foresee the future because you get all sorts of biases. You get a bias from the first speaker. Everyone then frames their arguments in contrast to or in support of what the first speaker says. And certain charismatic individuals or certain high profile individuals deemed to be greater experts can move the needle on opinions, not because they're right, but because of the way other people defer to them. And you'll probably be aware that in group sessions, there are always some people whose opinions carry greater weight. And it's not always because they're right. And there's another problem. Once we express an opinion, we often find it hard to change that opinion because of our fear of losing face. And the greater expert people perceive us to be, then the higher stakes there are for us changing our opinions. So we need to find a way that allows people to be properly influenced by the ideas around them and to change their mind if they find those ideas compelling without losing face. And that's exactly what the Delphi model does. And we use the Delphi model for two things, decision making and forecasting. Decision making about what is the right thing to do and forecasting what we think is going to happen. And it harnesses the wisdom of a crowd without that crowd biasing one another but allowing that crowd's views to influence the thinking of the people around them in an appropriate manner. However, as with any tool, the Delphi method will only work when used properly and in the right circumstances. In an environment where we expect to see discontinuous change, in an environment where there is no one with sufficient expertise, the Delphi method will not work. And of course, forecasting in an environment where there is going to be massive discontinuous change, and no one can possibly have the expertise and you can't expect the right results. But in an environment where things are evolving, in an environment where there is expertise around the decision that needs to be made, Delphi method is a very practical and very sound tool. In project management terms, this means that the Delphi method is best for evolutionary projects, where the technology we're rolling out or the changes that we're making are relatively small and contained. If your project is trying to create something radically new, then the Delphi method may not be the approach for you. With that said, how does it work? What's the basic process for the Delphi method? Well, first, you need to identify the experts. Whether you're trying to solve a problem, make a decision or forecast the future, you need a panel of people who really understand what's going on and the situation at hand. But my advice is make sure you go for a breadth of experts, people who understand different aspects of the challenge 
and indeed people with expertise that goes wider than just the narrow focus that you're looking at. That way you can bring in a number of different views because as with so many things, a diversity of thinking will really help, especially because the Delphi method is all about harnessing that diversity and feeding it in in a way that people can reevaluate their views based on the different ideas that are around. You will also need a facilitator, which may be you, of course. You will also need a basic expert to help frame the questions, which may be you, of course. And you will also need an administrator or coordinator, not just to manage the process, but to manage the paperwork and keep records. And yes, you guessed it, that may be you too. Once you have your experts signed up, got a facilitator, you've got an expert to help frame the questions and you've got an administrator, the next thing to do is to research and design the first set of questions that you're going to pose to your panel of experts. And of course, as with everything, garbage in, garbage out. If you ask the wrong questions, you will get the wrong answers. So you need to put a lot of work into crafting good quality questions. The questions need to be clear and precise. If they're vague and ambiguous, then the answers you get are going to be vague and ambiguous and therefore of not much use. It's also important that when you set the questions, every one of your expert gets an identical briefing and an identical set of questions. Otherwise, you're going to create all sorts of problems as people answer a slightly different question. And then when you share their answers in subsequent phases, you don't know what's going on. And here's the crucial thing. Ensure that when you ask your experts the questions, you require them to not only give their answers, but explain their reasoning what data, what facts, what evidence are they relying on, and how are they interpreting it? How do they go from what they're able to observe and what they already know to their answer? The reason for this is because when you receive all of their answers and all of their reasoning, you're going to tabulate it and analyze it and segment it. You're going to prepare the next set of questions based on what you learned. But when you pose those questions, exactly the same questions to the whole of the panel in the second round, you are also going to present them in anonymous format, all of the answers and all of the reasoning that their colleagues gave in the previous round. But because you are asking each person individually and presenting the information anonymously, this will allow each of your experts to evaluate all of the evidence in crafting their second answer. And they won't be biased by their attitude to who might have given one answer or another answer. And they won't feel that they're going to lose face because they know that if they change their mind, that won't be evident to anybody because it's all done anonymously. What this tends to do is allow people to spot whether their answer is an outlier and to evaluate whether they have significant evidence to suggest that they are right to be an outlier or whether they missed something. Or perhaps to spot another expert with a wildly different view to theirs, but to see in the evidence and the reasoning that that expert had spotted something that nobody else had spotted. You keep gathering in the responses and the evidence and analyzing them and tabulating them, developing new questions and presenting that to the experts until you get convergence, until a significant number, ideally all of the experts converge on a consensus view. When you have a useful indication of what your decision should be, how you should solve the problem or what they expect to be happening in the future, that's when you stop and thank your experts. And of course, at the last step, you'll prepare a report which summarizes all of the points of views and all of the evidence and what the consensus view is and why, if you need to neglect or ignore 
one point of view from one expert or another point of view from another expert why you're choosing to do that. And as a courtesy, share that with the experts. As you'd expect, there are a number of benefits and weaknesses with the Delphi model. One of the benefits, particularly in the modern world, is that you don't have to get people together in a group for a meeting, which means you can draw your expert panel from around the world. And secondly, because they're not all working together, their perceptions of one another will not bias the way that they approach the question. Indeed, a major benefit of the Delphi method is it is very good at eliminating biases because of the anonymity. And finally, the anonymity also means that it's much easier for experts to change their mind without fear of losing face. There are, of course, weaknesses to the process. Firstly, you might find that experts drop out if it takes too long, because the second weakness is that it can take a long time to reach consensus. You may need to go through round after round after round. It is an intensive process that can require a lot of resources. If you are the facilitator and the expert who is developing the next round of questions and doing the analysis and the administrator who is coordinating the whole process, that's a lot of work. And it's worth noting that although this feels like it's very scientific, it is just a process of asking people what they think. As a result, if there is a prevailing view among the expert community, that in itself could create a bias in the answers you get, which is why diversity matters. If you get some diverse thinkers, possibly from outside of the normal expert community, you may introduce new ideas to the community. And the benefit, of course, is because it's coming in anonymously, those ideas should and would hope be evaluated fairly. So my top tips are to choose a diverse group, to ensure that the questions you ask and the way that you ask them don't inadvertently introduce a bias. And critically, because it's important that you keep the expert group together for the whole process, keep them informed of what's going on, keep them engaged and prepare really high quality reports and resources for them to assess at each round. If you do all this, then the Delphi model is a tremendous way to get forecasts of what's going to happen and to make decisions. And it's something that I would always suggest that you consider on your projects. Please do give a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this video. There'll be loads more great project management content to come, so please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of that content. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.